Okay, let's grab our seats as quickly as we can. I'm always conscious that when I say go and connect for a few minutes, that it can become carnage in here. People enjoy connecting and fellowshipping so much more. But let's, let's lower the decibel limit now. Thank you very much. Grab your seats. And if you've got your Bibles, turn with me to the Gospel of John and chapter 20. That's John's Gospel and the 20th chapter. Maybe just, just a tiny bit up, Andy. Thank you so much. We're going to read the Easter story, John 20, verses 1 to 10, in just a moment. But I need to just give one final update and notice. Last Sunday, we uh, spoke about the devastating fire that broke out in the Philippines. Behind me on the screen will be some images of that. There were a team from Gateway, a mission team of seven that went out just uh, three weeks ago. And one week after we came back, this incredible devastating fire broke out. Out, the worst one in the history of our missionary friends there. They've been there 17 years. They said it was like a war zone at the end. Five fire brigades, five, five fire engines took over five hours to put the fire out. Thankfully, no casualties, but a lot of devastation. Two uh, two and a half thousand people lost their homes. And by homes, I mean shacks. And uh, the poverty there was a, another level. I am humbled this morning to say that we opened a Philippines fire appeal last Sunday morning and we said you can either give online church or you can put an envelope in the offering bag marked fire appeal within three days over four thousand pounds came in and that is your generosity and glory to God for it the appeal runs for uh, another two weeks and so, because people come to me and said, I wasn't prepared, ready to give last week. We're, two weeks today, the appeal will close. We're going to send the first 4,000 out uh, this weekend as they start the, the job of rebuilding. But if you want to give, then either online or just put an envelope into the offering basket. But please mark it Philippines or fire so that it can be designated accordingly. Okay. So good to be in the house of God this morning. Always is uh, great to come together as the family of God. But there's something special about Easter Sunday. Isn't that right, church? Yeah. I mean, it's Resurrection Sunday every week because we believe that Christ died, was buried, and the third day raised back to life. So in one sense, it's Resurrection Sunday every week. But there is something significant, powerful about when all of God's people all over this world and some people Easter Sunday is now over in some parts of the world and they've come together to celebrate the fact that the grave couldn't keep him that death couldn't hold him and that Jesus Christ rose triumphantly from the dead and we've been doing that in worship this morning now we're going to read the Easter story from John 20 this is what it says subtitled the empty tomb early on the first day of the week while it was still dark Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and she saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance so she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple the one that Jesus loved that was John and said they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they have put him so Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb both were running but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first and he bent over and looked at the strips of linen lying there but he did not go in then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb and he saw the strips of linen lying there as well as the cloth that had been wrapped round Jesus head and the cloth was still lying in its place separate from the linen and finally the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside and he saw and believed Can I just pause there for a minute because in all my preparation this week that has hit me with a force right now that it didn't when I was reading the John's account earlier the other disciple who had reached the tomb first John went inside and he saw and believed they still didn't understand from scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. I reckon this is my 
let me get my sums right here, 42nd Easter Sunday morning with God's people. Since as an 18-year-old, I trusted the resurrected Christ to come into my life and change me and forgive me of my sins. This must be now my 34th uh, Sunday that I've probably got up somewhere to preach a Easter message. And I've probably told the Easter story from so many different gospels and so many different perspectives, but the truth and the reality of the story never changes. Christ died, he was buried, and on the third day, God raised him supernaturally back to life. And as I was preparing for the service today, two phrases came to mind. And the phrases were this, the greatest comeback of all time. Oh, come on, have I got an amen in this Pentecostal church this morning? You're very muted and subdued today. It's Easter Sunday morning. Come on, the greatest comeback of all time. And the second phrase is this, and the story is not over. Don't know about you, but I find that comebacks, especially in the sporting world, is powerful. There's nothing that I enjoy more than watching a great sporting comeback, whatever the sport is. I'm going to just share an introduction, one or two this morning. So some of the ladies may switch off at this point. Some will lean in. Some of the guys will switch off at this point. Others will lean in. But who remembers the Champions League game in 2017 when Barcelona was playing Paris Saint-Germain of France? Barcelona were 4-0 down from the first leg in Paris. And they got back into the game in the second leg in France by scoring three first half goals. The problem was that PSG may score again in the second half. And after 87 minutes, as the game was drawing to a close, Barcelona were 5-3 down on aggregate. And then step forward a young Brazilian striker called Neymar. Who's ever, give me a wave of your head of Neymar. I think there was 200 million pounds or something he was transferred for. This amazing striker who scored in the 87th minute. It's now 5-4. He scored in the 91st minute. It's now 5-5. And those of us who can remember watching on TV are leaning into our TV screens as Neymar, as Neymar made it 6-5 to Barcelona. The greatest comeback in the history of Champions League football. Any tennis fans in the house this morning? Someone shaking their head at me right now. Well, even if you're not a tennis fan, don't we love Andy Murray, our national treasure, sporting icon? Andy Murray, the guy that when he loses, uh, they call him Scottish, this is in Britain, and when he wins, they call him English. I think that's what they say, but he, British. But he is Scottish, 100% from the Dumblane area. We've all heard of, there he is on this screen. Look at the passion and the emotion and the excitement in that face. One of the greatest ever comebacks featured our own Andy Murray last year. January 2023. The Australian Open there in Melbourne. He's just won his first round game in a pulsating five set match. Two days later, he's back on the heat of the court, 40 degrees in temperature. The place is unbearably hot. And the Australian opponent, I think it's Tanasi Kokinakis. Apologies if I've, if I've uh, shared his name wrongly this morning, but that guy, anyway. The game lasted almost six hours in the baking Australian sunshine. And Andy Murray battled from two sets down in his longest match ever to win 7-5 in the fifth set. All that with a metal hip too. Not bad for a 35-year-old Scotsman. The greatest comeback ever in Andy Murray's career. Okay, you're not looking very impressed, at the, so you're not tennis fans. There's got to be some rugby fans in Gateway this morning. Some Scottish rugby fans. Give me a cheer if you love the Six Nations. Give me a cheer if you enjoy watching Scotland beat the English. Oh, I knew that would get some of you going this morning. In March 2019, 
at the Calcutta Cup match, the Scotland-England game at Twickenham, down there in England and London. Scotland is 31-0 down just before halftime. Who remembers the game? Most of us have probably switched the telly off and gone and made a cup of coffee in the kitchen and gone for a walk or something. I mean, it's apart from Mike. Mike from Manchester is getting very excited in the middle of the church this morning. Mike was ecstatically ha happy just before half time that day. And in the greatest comeback of all time in Scottish rugby, Scotland came back to lead 38-31 before, sadly, unfortunately, a last gasp try by the English squared the match at 38 each. And that's how it finished. But who knows and agrees with me that the history books record that Scotland were the victors that day because we'd won the Calcutta Cup the year before. Therefore, at 38-38, we retained the cup. And just because you're looking so excited this morning and because I'm on live stream and any of my English friends are watching and we have beaten England on the last four years consecutively to keep the Calcutta Cup, I thought that might give a great big cheer in Gateway Church this morning. There is something powerful, emotional and exhilarating about a great sporting comeback. But I want to say this morning that it pales into total insignificance at the greatest comeback recorded in history that has changed not just time, but has changed human hearts and lives down through the years when just over 2,000 years ago they hung our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ on a Roman cross. They thrust not a crown of thorns that, this one is actually amazing. I was blown away by Trina's explanation, the intricacy of the, the, the crown. But the crown that they thrust on Jesus' head that day caused incredible pain and torture as a spear was thrust into his side, as they gave him wine vinegar to drink, as the blood was pouring out of parts of his body, as people were jeering and mocking, crucify him, crucify him. Only seven days earlier, he had ridden into Jerusalem on the donkey. We talked last Sunday about Palm Sunday and how it was, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, but the people were fickle. And seven days later, he, five days later, sorry, from Palm Sunday, he was crucified on a cross on that Good Friday. But you know something? The grave couldn't keep him. Oh, church, death could not hold him. The demons tried their very best, but he was supernaturally raised back to life by a supernatural God who is very much interested in your life and my life today. And on that first Easter Sunday morning, when, as we read in John's gospel, that Mary Magdalene and Mary and some of the women came to the tomb that day, they saw that the stone had been rolled away. And we just read it and maybe just glimpse at it and not taking the full significance. That was massive because the stone outside the tomb was reckoned to weigh between one and a half to two ton. And so something powerful had already happened. But as Mary Magdalene and some of the women came to the tomb that day, they had no idea that Jesus had been resurrected. Look at what verse two says. As they came to the tomb, they came, so she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, that's John, and said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they have put him. Everyone at that point still thought that Jesus was dead. They had no idea that the greatest comeback in history was about to begin. They had no idea that day as they approached the tomb that the story wasn't over. In Luke's account of the crucifixion and resurrection, in Luke 24, it says this, they did not believe the woman because their words seemed to them like nonsense. So the disciples were skeptical. The women were emotional, but the story wasn't over. Isn't that right, church? The greatest comeback this side in history was about to begin. Let's read on through John's gospel chapter 20, so verse 3. So Peter and John started for the tomb. Both were running, 
But the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. And he saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Luke's account of this story says, Peter got up and ran to the tomb, bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by itself, and he went away wondering to himself, what really has happened here? He was unsure. He did not know that the greatest comeback in history was being played out before his very eyes and that the story wasn't over. And as you read through Matthew's account and Mark's account, Luke's account and John's account of the crucifixion and the resurrection, I I love the raw honesty of the gospel writers. They document the skepticism and unbelief of the very people who were soon to become the spokespersons of this new movement called the early church. They documented their disbelief, but the story wasn't over. The greatest comeback in history was about to play out before their very eyes. As we go through John's gospel in chapter 20, we find that the resurrected Christ comes and finds the disciples hiding behind locked doors in Jerusalem, scared because of what the Jews might do them, do to them, scared, bewildered, perplexed, confused. Their cry was, they've taken Jesus. They're coming for for us next. It's all doom and gloom, despair and despondency. But the story isn't over, church. The greatest comeback ever is about to be played out before their very eyes. And the resurrected Jesus pays the disciples a visit. He appears to Thomas. And Thomas, doubting Thomas, would not believe until he actually placed his hand into the the nail marks in the hands of Jesus and put his hand into his side. Only then will I believe. And, And John 20, 28, Thomas, as he did that, said, oh, my Lord and my God. And Jesus said, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. One of the men who was there that day that watched this incredible comeback and the greatest story ever being played out was Peter. Hi, I love Peter. He's the disciple who speaks first and then engages his brain and realizes that he's made an absolute mess of it and has to clean up his verbal mess. A disciple who professed undying love to Jesus many times and then would backtrack on that. Peter believed in Jesus. Then when Jesus was arrested, he stopped believing and he ran away. And when challenged by a little servant girl, if he knew Jesus, he denied he knew him. And then after the resurrection, as Jesus says, go tell my disciples and Peter, Peter. Make sure that Peter knows that Peter put his trust fully again within within the hands of Jesus. And church history tells us that ultimately he was beheaded for his faith in Jesus by the Roman Emperor Nero. But the same Peter before he died went on to write two New Testament letters, one Peter and second Peter. And the scripture is gonna come up right now from one Peter chapter one, verses three and four. This is a guy who doubted, was not sure what had happened. And then when he fully understood about the greatest comeback ever this side of heaven and that the story wasn't over, this is what he said. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope. We sang about that living hope earlier in the service this morning through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you. You see, what did happen on that first Easter morning as the 
woman went to the tomb and the stone was rolled away and there was no body there. Well, many theories have been thrown out over the years and disproved. Some have said that Christ didn't actually just die, he just swooned. And when his body was taken down from the cross and placed in the cold air of the tomb, the cold air of the tomb revived him? I think not. Some people say, well, the disciples stole the, the body. They went into the tomb, stole the body, and, and, and hid the body because they didn't want to be shown up. Well, a one and a half ton to two ton stone they had to move, they had to overpower 16 Roman guards who stood in front of that tomb? I think not. So what did happen on that first Easter morning? Well, what does the Bible say? Because that is the truth of it all. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. It will come up on the screen right now, verses one to four. Now, brothers and sisters, says Paul, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved. If you hold firmly to the word I preach to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. Now listen to this, verse three. For, I, for what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures and then he appeared to Cephas and, and to the twelve and then the Bible says he appeared to more than 500 people over a period of 40 days. In Acts 1 and 3, one of my favorite New Testament scriptures says that he gave many convincing proofs as he presented to them that he was alive over a period of 40 days and he spoke about the kingdom of God. So as I bring this message to a close, and in just a moment, Joanna's gonna come and just minister a song into your heart and my heart that simply says, Calvary covers it all. What did happen that first Easter Sunday? Well, he willingly went to the cross. He bled and he died and was crucified for the weight and the guilt of the sins of the world, past, present, and future, including your sin and my sin. And then on that first Easter Sunday morning, the, the death couldn't hold him anymore. The grave couldn't keep him. And God supernaturally breathed life back into that dead body. And he was miraculously raised from the dead. The reality is this morning that if you take away the resurrection message, we have nothing, nothing, church, to hold on to as Christians today. This is how important the resurrection is. It's the anchor, it's the bedrock of the whole Christian faith. And that's why I get so annoyed when different parts of the body of Christ try to disprove the reality of the resurrection. Oh, no, no, no. He died, was buried, and three days later, God raised him from the dead. And this morning, he is very much alive. Yes. Bible says he's at Father's right hand in heaven, praying for people like you and I today interested in every part of our lives, interested in your cares and worries, interested in your family, interested in your job, interested in everything. And he loves us so much that he was willing to leave heaven, come to this earth, and die on a cross at the age of 33. So as Joanna sings this song, if you wanna close your eyes, close your eyes, and then I'm gonna give one quick prayer and appeal and before we sing our final song. It simply says, Calvary covers it all. Too much. 
much for the souls of men, but somehow you hold it all up on the cross. Calvary is enough. Calvary is enough. When I know nothing, when I know too much, what I choose to know. in a word of prayer right now Calvary is enough he died on a Roman cross for your sin and my sin on the third day God raised him back to life defeating death hell and the grave opening up the way for people like you and I to get to know this extraordinary God the Bible says that the only way we can be assured of going to heaven when we die one day is knowing Jesus as our personal Lord and Savior. And in these last few moments, before we sing any more, before we head for coffee and fellowship afterwards, while every head is bowed and every eye is closed, I give the simple opportunity and the appeal in person here in Gateway Church, those downstairs in the auditorium, those that are on the balcony, those that are watching online right now, if you've never committed your life to Christ, if you've never invited the Savior of the world to come into your heart, to forgive you of your sins and make you a brand new person, you can do that on this Easter Sunday morning, March the 31st, 2024, the greatest decision that any, any of us could ever make is giving our lives into the hands of God who loves us and who gave Jesus for us. So in these last few seconds, as we remain in prayer, if you're in church this morning and you're saying, Andrew, I need to get to know this God personally. I need Jesus to come and be my Lord, my God and my Savior. Well, every head is bowed and eyes are closed. Just raise your hand so I can see it because leaders in this church want to talk with you and 
and pray with you at the end of the service and lead you to the most important decision of your life, that Jesus is Lord and Savior. Is there anyone in Gateway this morning who's saying, Andrew, that's me. Here's my hand. God bless you. I see that hand at the back. Anyone else this morning? God bless you. Father, I simply pray that that question of knowing whether you are Lord and Savior of our lives, I pray that long after service is finished, long after Easter eggs are eaten, long after we head home and family lunches and dinners go, happen, that you will keep on speaking and knocking at the door of many hearts and lives with the most important question anyone will ever be asked to answer. Will I accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior? Thank you that on that first Easter Sunday morning, just over 2,000 years ago, it was the greatest comeback of all when you defeated death, hell, and the grave. And for that, we are eternally thankful and grateful in Jesus' mighty name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Stand with me to sing our final song this morning. Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God.
greatest comeback of the greatest story ever told. Many say it's a fable that the Christian faith is nothing more than odd beliefs and opinions that have no relevance in the modern age. Well, the death and resurrection of Jesus was recorded by Roman and Jewish historians that would actually have been in opposition to the truth claims of Jesus and in opposition to any story out there that was obviously a lie. Over the centuries, a body of knowledge has developed regarding the death, resurrection and ascension of Jesus. A universal truth needs to be true in any nation and in any culture, not just for a certain people in a time or place. So the truth of the gospel can stand alongside the universal truth claims of mathematics, of science and technology. There's a solid history regarding the death resurrection and ascension of Jesus and the birthing of the church. And we're not called to be churchy people in this generation. We're called to be truth establishers regarding the death and resurrection of Jesus on that Roman cross 2,000 years ago. Because at some stage in our journey, we put the so-called truth claims to the test and discovered that Christ Jesus is alive. That the truth of the word of God is, is more true than reality itself. That it changed the reality in what we were living in. And whilst we can testify personally, this gospel is designed to change, transform and disciple cities and nations, indeed the entire world. The gospel of the kingdom is alive and well on planet earth this Sunday as we acknowledge the death and resurrection of Jesus. Have a blessed week as you reflect on the truth claims. You have heard today the service is now over, and if you're a first-time visitor, please come through to our cafe, that door there, and enjoy some tea, coffee, and fellowship with us. It's so good to see back in the house Jean Geddes this morning, <laughs> and Leslie Queen too. Both had a, a stay in hospital, and both are Clyde-built. The shipyards may be gone, but these two women are Clyde-built. Absolutely. Have a great week.